10. NSA Surveillance The Washington Post originally uncovered the existence of a National Security Administration and FBI program called PRISM, allowing the agencies to take photos, videos, emails, and even chats from various different servers and internet companies, like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and Apple. Anonymous then leaked 13 documents that they said detailed the specifics of the PRISM program. A statement posted with the leak said, These documents prove that the NSA is spying on you, and not just Americans. Like we said, this is happening in over 35 countries and done in cooperation with private businesses and intelligence partners worldwide. We bring this to you so that you know just how little rights you have. Your privacy and freedoms are slowly being taken from you, in closed door meetings, in laws buried in bills, and by people who are supposed to be protecting you. Number 9. Russian Leak Three Russian entities, the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation, the City Administration of Blagoveshensk, and the Governor's Office of the Tver region all lost hundreds of thousands of emails when the anonymous group hacked them and leaked over 700 gigabytes of data. The emails contained sensitive information like state policies regarding art, cinematography, archives, copyright, cultural heritage, and censorship. The group had also previously said that they managed to shut down Russia's space agency, preventing the country from having the power to spy using satellites, reportedly downloading and deleting confidential files related to the satellite imaging and vehicle monitoring. They also stole 35,000 different files from Russia's central bank, all of this coming as part of an ongoing group effort to get Russia to withdraw from their conflict. Number 8. Police Documents in June of 2020, Anonymous completed Operation Blue Leaks, which involved hacking and releasing a massive amount of police documents. They got information from over 200 different law enforcement agencies and gathered a total of 269 gigabytes of data. The documents included things like phone numbers, banking information, and even alleged crimes. The documents were apparently leaked to provide insight into the strategies and mindset of law enforcement. One person involved saying, I've seen a few comments about it being unlikely to uncover gross police misconduct, but I think those somewhat miss the point, or at least equate police misconduct solely with illegal behavior. Part of what a lot of the current protests are about is what police do and have done legally. It's the largest published hack of American law enforcement agencies. It provides the closest inside look at the state, local, and federal agencies tasked with protecting the public. Number 7. Canadian Centres After an event took place regarding one of the group's members, Anonymous gained a bit of a vendetta against the Canadian government that led to their targeting. They leaked a high-level federal document that included information about the redevelopment of Canada's key diplomatic centres in Britain, the National Post even confirming it to be authentic. It was marked Confidence of the Queen's Privy Council and included information about the cost of the selling, relocating and rebuilding of Canada's Foreign Affairs Department in London, but it was mostly focused on the eventual profit that would come about as a result. It raised many alarms within the government and population about just how secure our information is, and what other secrets could be at risk to be easily stolen and published. A spokesperson for Anonymous said that the information was leaked in order to try and influence the federal elections. Number 6. Census Bureau Back in 2015, Anonymous targeted the United States Census Bureau, their hacking group compromising the data of over 4,000 workers. They did not share how they managed to get the information, but did release it from the databases, including usernames, emails, and phone numbers of government staff. A spokesperson for the Bureau confirmed the attack, saying, The U.S. Census Bureau is investigating an IT security incident relating to unauthorized access to non-confidential information on an external system that is not part of the Census Bureau internal network. Access to the external system has been restricted while our IT forensics team investigates. Anonymous claims their motivation for the attack was to protest the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade negotiations, which were rumored to potentially lead to the privatization of services in the UK like free healthcare. Number 5. Chilean Army Leak 
In 2019, the people of Chile started protesting inequality, and things between the protesters and the police force and military quickly started to get violent. This led to Anonymous targeting Chile's military in a large leak of their information and data. The contents of six different email accounts and a total of 3,500 emails were hacked and released to the public. The information included things like meetings between army officials and businessmen, contacts with foreign security firms, and even cooperation agreements with the United States government. Two of the most prominent email accounts to be exposed were that of the financial boss and the director of intelligence for the army. All the emails were uploaded to an information distribution center and were made available to be accessed by anyone. After the incident, the Chilean army worked hard to implement further security measures and try to track down those responsible. Number 4. Federal Reserve in 2013, Super Bowl Sunday was shaken up by not just a football game, but by Anonymous hacking into the American Federal Reserves. They managed to gain access to personal information of government members and banking officials, including their phone numbers, home addresses, email addresses, and passwords of around 4,000 different people. Anonymous apparently did this as part of an ongoing protest against the U.S. Department of Justice. A Federal Reserve spoke Spokesperson said, The Federal Reserve System is aware that information was obtained by exploiting a temporary vulnerability in a website vendor product. The exposure was fixed shortly after discovery and is no longer an issue. This incident did not affect critical operations of the Federal Reserve System. Other attacks that took place as a part of the same protest included the hacking of the website of the United States Sentencing Commission. Number 3. Canadian Security Leak There was another attack against the Canadian government that took place just before the first one that I mentioned on this list, all a part of Anonymous's grudge against Canada. These leaked documents revealed information in regards to Canada's spy agency, the CSIS or Canadian Security Intelligence Service. It shared sensitive information like the size of its network of foreign stations, the volume of secret communications they handle, and their outdated system of information sharing. Before the release, the government had only previously acknowledged three foreign stations, Washington, London, and Paris, but a leaked classified document revealed that there were actually over 25, many of them quote, located in developing countries and or unstable environments. Apparently their security systems had not been updated since the 1980s. A spokesperson for Anonymous saying, we are now privy to many of Stephen Harper's most cherished secrets, Stephen Harper being the head of the country at the time. Number 2. Operation Hong Kong Similarly to the situation in Chile, Anonymous's Operation Hong Kong came about as a response to the mistreatment of protesters. In 2014, they announced that they would be launching a massive cyber attack against Chinese government servers and bringing down their websites. An anonymous statement said, Here's your heads up, prepare for us. Try to stop it. The only success you will have will be taking all your sites offline. China, you cannot stop us. You should have expected us before abusing your power against the citizens of Hong Kong. Throughout October of that year, Anonymous made claims that they had already managed to access many of the country's government websites, and apparently had sensitive emails that they were threatening to release. However, it doesn't look like any of these emails ever actually made it to the public eye. Number 1. Syrian President Leak In 2012, Anonymous managed to hack into the Syrian Ministry of Presidential Affairs, gaining access to the email accounts of 78 staffers working under the current president. It was apparently a pretty easy job as it was revealed that the man didn't have a very secure password. 33 of the 78 email accounts all used the password 12345 or 123456. Not exactly Fort Knox. Hundreds of different emails were revealed, including a conversation between the United Nations and the President's media advisor, preparing him for an upcoming interview with Barbara Walters. The year before this, Syria also received the attention of the hacking group when they hacked the Syrian Defense Ministry, changing their website to give a message of support to the Syrian people who were trying to fight back against the control of their president. In our number 10 spot, we have Chick-fil-A. There is something called the Mandela Effect that is a term 
term that was invented to describe a situation where a large group of people remember a situation different than how it is. But of course, if you brought an entire human race into a new dimension, how else are you going to explain how so many people remember different events and situations that happened to the ones they're being presented with now? Naturally, you would invent a term to convince everyone into believing that their memories are false and what they remember was influenced by a common eye trick or a memory trick. Like in the case of Chick-fil-A. A large group of people remember the famous restaurant without a K. I am one of those people actually. When doing my research on this, I thought the incorrect spelling was with the K. But in fact, Chick-fil-A always had a K apparently. The thing that nobody can question me on specifically is a memory I have of looking at a Chick-fil-A sign and thinking, as a kid, why isn't there a K? So take that government. That's a very specific thought memory that you can't influence. Who else remembers it without a K? Let me know in the comment section below. In our number nine spot, we have Skechers. This is another label that has been questioned over the last few years by many, and it has also been attributed to the Mandela effect. Most people agree that the brand Skechers spells their name S-K-E-T-C-H-E-R-S. -E -E but actually in this reality, okay fine, perhaps maybe just in reality in general, who knows, the brand is spelt S-K-E-C-H-E-R-S. -E -E there is apparently no T. This is another situation where I personally remember it being spelled with a T. When I was younger, I remember writing about it in a report for school and I did not know how to spell it. I remember sounding it out and then when I looked it up, I was surprised that it had a silent T. Somebody explain this memory, please. You cannot convince me that it is Skechers with no T. It just doesn't look right. I wonder at what age do people start thinking that there is no T? That'll give us a good idea as to when we got transported into a new dimension. In our number eight spot, we have the Torrid Traveler. I had to include this story in here as it is such a wonder as to why it is not talked about more. Does the government not want people to talk about this for a reason? Possibly. In 1954, there was a man who was traveling to Tokyo, Japan when he got off the plane in Tokyo and was pulled aside by security for having a passport from a country that didn't exist. The customs officials grilled the man on why he had a fake passport and fake custom papers and annoyed, he insisted that his passport and papers were real. He supposedly had all kinds of bank statements and documents from a country in Europe called Torrid. The police pointed to an actual country called Andorra, and apparently the man insisted that yes, that is where his country is, but it is called Torrid, and it's been around for thousands of years. The man was held in a hotel for several hours while the government analyzed his papers. The next morning when the government went into the hotel room to speak with him, he had vanished back to his parallel universe, I think. In our number seven spot, we have the case of Lorena Garcia. This is a very interesting story. I definitely think it is possible that this story was covered up as it is a story that a lot of people do not know of and may be shocked to hear about. A woman by the name of Lorena Garcia woke up one morning to find that nothing was familiar to her. Her home, her friends, her job, she did not recognize a thing. She still looked like herself and had the same name, but her room and basically everything was different. The story made a few newspapers, but it eventually died, as it would, of course, if it is a story that a lot of people shouldn't hear about so that we don't all start collectively putting the pieces together and questioning everything, as we probably would. People thought that she suffered from memory loss, however, all signs actually pointed to her being in perfect health, as well as nothing traumatic had occurred that would make anyone believe that theory. So. In conclusion, she probably slipped into a parallel dimension that the government didn't want us to know. In our number six spot, we have the Backwards Universe. An experiment was done by NASA's Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, or ANITA. ANITA, darling. <laughs> A little 101 Dalmatians reference for ya. Gosh, I get distracted so easily. <laughs> An experiment was performed high above Antarctica where it was observed that there is a constant wind of high energy particles coming up from the Earth, and these findings showed scientists that these particles actually traveled backwards in time, which suggests a parallel universe. Quote Low energy subatomic neutrinos with a mass close to zero can pass completely through Earth, but Higher energy objects are stopped by the solid matter of our planet, according to this 
report. That means the high energy particles can only be detected coming down from space, but the teams and NITA detected heavier particles, so called tau neutrinos, which come up out of the Earth. Is this proof of another backwards dimension? Some scientists, such as Peter Gorham, believe it is possible. In our number five spot, we have Star Wars. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> okay, this one could very well have been misconstrued over time as people have repeated this in many movies and it's possible that someone somewhere just decided to throw in the Luke bit so that people understood which character Vader was the father of. Makes sense, but still in online platforms, people are convinced that at some point in time, Darth Vader said, Luke, I am your father, instead of what is actually said, I am your your father. No Luke. Is this a sign that in another universe Luke was actually said? I don't know. This is a bit of a weak sign for me, but others disagree. Would love to know your thoughts in the comment section below. Did the government cover this one up? <laughs> in our number four spot, we have the Triangle Phenomena. The Bermuda Triangle, the Alaskan Triangle, the Nevada Triangle. These are all strange places that puzzle people around the world. These are places where planes and people have gone missing on many accounts. It could be a strange coincidence coincidence, but a lot of people believe that these disappearances are more likely a sign of a portal to another dimension. Perhaps these people and planes traveled through these portals and ended up somewhere else, as not a body or piece of the planes have ever been found from any of these places. There has to be some explanation. Either that, or it's a government special operation, or there's mythical creatures getting in the way. There are so many theories around these triangles, but the number one theory is that they are a sign of a parallel universe. In our number three spot, we have unidentified objects. Over the years, there have been a lot of unidentified objects that have popped up around the world that no one can explain. Archaeologists have discovered items that don't belong in areas that they are exploring, and at times, there have even been objects that don't seem like they are a part of this world or from this world. A good example of this is a hammer that was found in London in the 1930s, and this hammer is said to be over 500 million years old. Wow, when humans weren't known to exist. There was also an object that was found that is a sort of stone-like computer that would have been from 2,000 years ago, and this object was found near a Greek island not too long ago. Many people believe these mysterious objects are traveling through dimensions and that they are a huge sign that there are universes that we are unaware of. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. In our number two spot, we have Area 51. Look, it is no secret that Area 51 is the most unusual place, and it is probably one of the most guarded places in the world, but why? The government's explanation is that it's a secret army operation place. Sure, okay. If we wanted to plan future attacks or train for future wars, we will definitely need a secret place to do those things. So that's a pretty good reason, and that's why it's believable to your average Joe that doesn't bother to look into it any further. But for the person that decides to look into some of the stories that surround Area 51, man, are there many they might think otherwise. The most popular theory is that there is a parallel universe portal inside, as people in the surrounding area have reported disappearing and showing up in random locations. In our number one spot, we have the particle test. There is a large hadron collider that is the largest and highest particle collider and is 27 kilometers below the surface of the Earth, aka in an underground facility between the France-Switzerland border. It was originally designed between 1998 and 2008 by CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, as a collaboration project between 10,000 scientists and hundreds of labs and universities from from over a hundred different countries. It is believed that the purpose of this device was to create a black hole in reality, which may take us to a parallel universe. Regardless of what they were actually doing, they did stumble across something pretty crazy. Apparently, the scientists threw a bunch of particles around at crazy speeds and noticed that the particles disappeared for a moment, and they were able to measure how long the particles disappeared for. From this experiment, it has been assumed that the particles traveled to new dimensions or planes of existence when they disappeared. One of the scientists at CERN by the name of Aurelian Barrow has even said, the multiverse is no longer a model. It is a consequence of our models. Well, sounds like proof to me. The government's got to do a better job at hiding this. 
Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Teapot Dome scandal. Ah yes, what's a list of cover-ups without a good old story of bribery? Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior to former President Warren G. Harding, and while in this position, he decided to secretly allow oil companies to tap into the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve in Wyoming and the Elk Hills Oil Reserve in California. Of course, the reason he did it is because he could make a ton of extra money doing this, like several hundred thousand dollars. This all started to unravel though in 1922 when there was an expose that revealed the oil had been sold without any sort of competitive bidding. After this expose, Robert La Follette, who is a senator in Wisconsin, created an investigation into the story by the Senate Committee on Public Lands. The Attorney General at the time, Harry Dowdery, began to get some flack for not investigating this alleged corruption, so Harry turned to the FBI Director to help him out. The FBI Director, William J. Burns, sent an agent to Robert, the senator from Wisconsin's, office to search for anything that could have been used to blackmail him into stopping the investigation into the corruption. Despite this seemingly obvious threat, Robert knew this meant that his investigation was going to reveal something serious, which motivated him to continue on with it. In the end, the shady dealings and bribery was revealed, and Albert Fall was officially exposed. This entire ordeal led to him being the first United States cabinet secretary to go to prison. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Dreyfus Affair. In 1984, France's government and their army were in some hot water for a series of scandals that had recently happened when a janitor discovered papers that revealed just another scandal to add to the list. This janitor had found papers in a garbage bin of a German military ambassador that revealed that there was a French officer who had turned against them and who was spying on the Germans. When this came to light, they needed a way out of the mess, so they decided to use a scapegoat, a man named Alfred. Alfred Dreyfus. Alfred was a Jewish officer in the French army and they decided to accuse him of this spying and the selling of secrets. His trial was huge in the media and he ended up being sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island and really hateful and prejudiced groups used his as an example of a quote unquote unpatriotic Jewish person. Later, the chief of military intelligence would uncover evidence that proved who the real spying culprit was, but when this happened, the chief of military intelligence was removed moved from his position by his superiors to try and keep the secret from getting out. It is said that French authorities tried to suppress these accusations, but a novelist named Emile Zola continued to accuse the army of a cover-up. People were torn at this point. Some people swear that Alfred was still to blame, while others were convinced he was innocent. In the end, the fight became more about principle rather than whether or not Alfred was really innocent or not. There were 12 years of controversy surrounding this case until Major Hubert Joseph Henry ended up admitting to forging the key documents before taking his own life. The case was finally reopened and while Alfred was found guilty again, he soon received a pardon from the president. A few years after this, a civilian court of appeals found Alfred innocent and he went on to have quite an army career and he even fought with honor in the first world war. This was a scandal that really did change French politics forever. In our number 8 spot today we have the Ford Pinto. Introduced in 1971, the Ford Pinto would go on to become the car with the worst safety reputation but of course, not without an attempt to cover up all of the flaws first. During the car's development, during the final stages, there was crash testing being conducted, and this is when designers found out a flaw with the car. Basically, through their tests, they found that the fuel tank's filler neck had a tendency to be torn away, which would then spill gasoline under the car, as well as the fact that the tank itself was able to be easily punctured by nearby bolts. To fix this issue, it would have cost about $11 per car, but instead of spending that money, they decided to just do nothing. Yeah, they just said F it and figured that it would cost less to pay off the people who bought the car and had the issues that caused their car to catch fire. Sounds absolutely insane, and thankfully, an investigative reporter by the name of Mark Dowie thought so too. He went through a ton of paperwork that lay in the US Department of Transportation's file cabinets, and this is when he found what he was looking for, a memo where the company calculated that settling the lawsuits brought against them would save the company $70 million rather than 
than just installing the new parts and fixing the issue for everybody's safety and well-being. Mark wrote an expose on the story and once published, a jury in Orange County, California awarded $125 million in damages to a man who'd been injured in a Pinto that caught fire. The ruling was later reduced to just $3 million, but it did kickstart the end of the car and the beginning of the scrutiny that the company would face. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Prohibition poisoning. You probably already know about the Prohibition era, but if not, this was a time period where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government, and this lasted from 1920 to 1933. In knowing about the Prohibition comes the knowledge that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol, it was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number 6 spot today, we have the health risk denial. In this day and age, everyone knows that smoking cigarettes isn't great for your health, but back in the day, people didn't know, and the tobacco industry did everything they could to make sure that they never found out. In 1950, a physician and epidemiologist, Dr. Ernest Winder, published a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that pointed out the links between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. This is something that is well known and studied now, but at the time, this was news to much of the public, and to hide it, six major cigarette companies began to fund their own research efforts in response to the study. The study wasn't aimed at actually getting to the bottom of the health risks, it was just a research project meant for publicity reasons. In reality, they already knew about the health hazards and that there was a possible link to cancer. In a 1953 survey of scientific literature, a man named Cloud Teak, who was a chemist for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, concluded that, quote, studies of clinical data tend to confirm a link between the heavy use of cigarettes and lung cancer. A scientist for a major tobacco company at the time knew and had studied the links, and they were still trying to cloud the public perception of this huge issue. The entire strategy was later revealed in a 1972 industry memo, which described it as, quote, creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it. Finally, this madness was brought to an end, sort of, when the attorney generals from 46 states joined together in one massive lawsuit against the tobacco industry. As a result of this, while they can continue to make their harmful product, in 1998, the companies agreed to pay $10 billion annually to make up for the damage that they had done. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Chernobyl disaster. In April of 1986, crew members of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine were running a test to see how long a reactor's turbines would continue to supply power in the event of an electrical power outage. This test, however, went famously wrong due to a malfunction caused by a power surge. This caused overheating of the water inside of the reactor, which released a buildup of steam and thus explosions. These explosions caused radioactive debris and gas to be released into the atmosphere for the following 10 days. The story of Chernobyl is famous now, as it is one of the largest nuclear disasters in history. There were immediate deaths and more that followed shortly after, but there also has been a countless number of effects seen throughout the years it's been, and the area still remains dangerous due to the contamination. Despite the magnitude of the disaster, however, Soviet officials, because at the time Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union, they didn't publicly admit that the accident had happened at all. For two days, they kept totally quiet about this extremely dangerous thing, and it only came out when Swedish officials rang the alarm bells as they had found increased levels of radiation that had drifted a thousand kilometers westwards over to them. You think at this point they would have just fessed up, but of course not. The Soviet leader at the time, Mikhail Gorbachev, waited three weeks before even publicly mentioning the accident. Who knows what level of effect this might have had in a 
multitude of ways. In our number 4 spot today we have the safety cover up. Karen Silkwood was an American chemical technician and a labor union activist who was very vocal and often raised concerns about the corporate practices that related to the health and safety of those working in a nuclear facility. You would think that this is something that all of those working in the field would be concerned about, but apparently not. She worked a job making plutonium pellets and was the first woman on the union's negotiating team and after she testified to the Atomic Energy Commission about the things she was concerned about, it was discovered that she had plutonium contamination on both herself and in her home. Plutonium isn't an issue outside of the body but can easily be ingested or inhaled, which is when it creates a major problem for humans. Karen was driving to meet with a New York Times journalist and an official of her union's national office after deciding to go public with some of her findings, and the people who saw her right before she left for this meeting saw her with a binder full of documentations of her findings. During her trip in her car there, Karen ended up driving off of the road and striking a culvert, and this accident took her life. Here's where things get really suspicious though. That binder I just mentioned was never found. It was said that Karen had fallen asleep at the wheel and that almost twice the recommended dosage of methaqualone was found in her system. But there were clear skid marks on the road which suggested Karen was trying to get the car back straight on the road, and despite the accident being entirely at the front of the car, there was damage to the back of the car that friends and family say wasn't there before, and paint chips were found which would suggest a car had hit her from behind. To make this whole thing even more suspicious, apparently Karen was receiving death threats before her passing. There have of course been claims of foul play and claims that she was run off the road by another vehicle, but unfortunately with little to no evidence these claims have never been able to be proven for sure. But what is for sure is that whatever really happened to Karen, it seems like a simple accident doesn't cover the full truth. In the end however, because of everything that went on with Karen, the Department of Energy opened an investigation and ultimately shut down the facility. In the end, although it is so horrible that Karen lost hers, she definitely saved countless others lives. In our number 3 spot today we have the Pentagon Papers. In June of 1971, the New York Times published a few different excerpts that were taken from a top secret Department of Defense report that pertained to the United States and their involvement in the Vietnam War from 1945 to 1967. These papers were created as a part of a study by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and the reason they were so important and secret is because they revealed that four consecutive presidential administrations had lied to and misled both Congress as well as the American people about their involvement in the war. Daniel Ellsberg, who is said to have been a military analyst who opposed the war, leaked these confidential government records, and him, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post, all faced criminal charges in court for their efforts to get the papers into public knowledge, but in a turn of events, the charges were later dismissed. Not only were these papers important, but the leak was a crucial moment in time because it bred major, major distrust in the United States government that would only go on to grow. In our number two spot today, we have Operation Paperclip. I suppose this is less of a cover up and more of just a secret operation, but this one was kept a secret not for the safety of the people, but instead to prevent an uproar from the public. This operation began in 1946 when the President of the United States at the time, Harry Truman, authorized it. Basically, the entire point of it was to lure scientists from no Germany over to the United States after the Second World War. This was done in an effort to aid the country in their post-war efforts, as well as to ensure that the valuable knowledge these people had would not end up in the hands of perhaps the Soviet Union or either side of the divided East and West Germany. Had it not been classified information at the time, this would have been highly controversial as many of these people were involved in and sometimes even leaders of that hateful party we won't mention by name again. Former President Truman stood by his decision saying that because of the relations with the Soviet Union, quote, this had to be done and was done. Several of the scientists a part of this program were later investigated because of their former ties, but one was only ever tried out of the over 1,600. None of the paperclip scientists were ever found guilty for any crimes either in the United States or in Germany. Perhaps the most famous of all of the paperclip scientists was Werner von Braun, who really played a huge role in advancing NASA's Apollo missions. In our number one spot today, we have the Watergate scandal. It's perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel complex in Washington, D.C. As the year went on, the 1972 presidential election came closer, and there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post reporters that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political 
political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported on the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There was a series of Senate hearings and the Senate even went on to create a special investigative committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide and they had witnesses testifying that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in and that there was a voice activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks and in the end the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent impeachment Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign making him the only president to do so. His successor Gerald Ford ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution but there were 69 other people indicted with 48 of them later being convicted. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the Benton fireworks disaster. This one is like a cover up within a cover up. It's a cover up exception and that is because of the fact that this entire thing happened in an illegal business. Basically back in 1983 there was a factory explosion in Benton Texas that claimed the lives of 11 people. This factory was where the illegal business was and they made illegal fireworks and their cover up story for the business was that they were a worm farm. What? A worm farm? I guess I wouldn't necessarily suspect there to be an illegal firework factory at the worm farm so it's kind of a good disguise. Anyway the biggest problem with this entire operation is that none of the workers were properly trained or knew how to handle these dangerous chemicals. There was no Walter White in this operation. Like so much so that one of the workers who would later testify about what went on there explained that others at the factory would fill the fireworks with quote chemical stuff and her job was to add liquid glass and diffuse. No one is entirely sure what caused the explosion but there are a couple theories. The leading theory is that while well, normally the explosive ingredients were mixed by hand, on this day they might have been trying to mix it with something different like an electrical appliance. The other theory is based on how there were packs of cigarettes and a lighter found in the debris so it is possible that someone might have been smoking in the building. Either way the explosion was so huge that it was felt 20 miles away and investigators determined the factory to have been the largest and most profitable known illegal fireworks operation in US history. In our number 9 spot today we have the Burnden Park disaster. This is the name used to refer to one of the worst incidents in all of soccer history or football history if you want to get really specific. The Burnden Park disaster took place in 1946 when 33 fans died at the stadium one day before the game started. Despite these deaths the game did start and the players went on and played the game all the while these bodies were allegedly just covered up on the sidelines. The thought is pretty horrifying and it makes you ask how could this have happened? The thing with this particular game is that it was the first competitive match since World War II so of course people were excited. So excited that the stadium capacity was 70,000 but 85,000 people showed up. As this surge of people showed up for the game the crowds began to push through which led to hundreds of people being injured and the 33 deaths that we already spoke about. Most of the crowd had absolutely no idea what had happened. They didn't know that people had lost their lives and the players were just told to go ahead and do what they were there to do. This means that while people were laying dead and many more were laying injured, some severely, there were thousands of people who were just completely kept in the dark and they went on cheering none the wiser about what had just happened. In our number 8 spot today we have the Nedelin disaster. Back in the 60s the Soviet Union had planned to launch Russia's R-16 ballistic missile in July of 1961 but someone had a problem with this. That someone was the commander of the Soviet strategic missile forces Mitrofan Nedelin and he thought it would be a grand old idea to push up the launch to November 7th 1960. It was the anniversary of the Soviet revolution after all but of course rather than anniversaries and celebrations safety should be at the forefront of something like this. Because of the fact that almost an entire year was shaved off of the preparation time to launch corners ended up being cut. Even with these corners being cut workers were still scrambling to get everything fixed 
finished, with work being completed on the day of the actual launch, even after the rocket was fully fueled. But despite the workers best efforts to get everything ready in time, things ended in disaster. Some kind of an error led to the second stage rocket firing while being tested before the launch. This means that the second stage one was firing directly into the first stage one, which was full of fuel, and the whole thing turned into one enormous explosion. This meant that everyone who was still working and remotely close to the launch were killed. The camera operator was able to remotely activate automatic cameras set around the launching pad, which caught the entire explosion. The footage showed that people near the rocket were incinerated instantly, while those further away either burned or were poisoned by the toxic fuel component vapors. Of course, this is terrible and tragic, but here's where the cover up comes in. The news of the disaster was suppressed for many years, so much so that the government didn't even acknowledge it until 1989, almost 30 years after the incident occurred. It has been reported that even the families of those who lost their lives were made to keep quiet about the entire thing so as to ensure that there were no news leaks. In fact, they were told to tell people that their loved ones had died in a plane crash. That was how far the government was willing to go in order to cover their tracks on this incident. In our number 7 spot today, we have Operation Tiger. This operation was actually one in a series of large rehearsals for the D-Day invasion of Normandy, which took place in April of 1944. This project went horrifically awry, however, as coordination and communication problems led to there being friendly fire. This led to an allied convoy that was positioning itself for landing that being attacked by e-boats from the Kriegsmarine, which resulted in 749 American servicemen deaths. The terrible happenings don't end here though, because like I mentioned, this was a part of D-Day and the invasion. This was incredibly secret, so no one reported on it at all, meaning the family members of those killed had no idea. After D-Day, it is even said that then this was an event that was still quite minimally reported on. Many people believe that since those who made the plans for this rehearsal were not expecting any kind of attack or for things to go this way, they tried to keep everything under wraps so as to not be culpable for anything that happened. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Great Mississippi Flood. The Mississippi Flood of 1927 was one of the worst natural disasters of the century, as hundreds of thousands of homes were left destroyed, with even more people being displaced in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. As a response to this horrible disaster, then Secretary of Commerce Hebert Hoover, along with the Red Cross, began setting up fundraising to restore the over 23,000 square miles of land that had been covered by the flood, and also, of course, to provide a great public image for doing so. Herbert quickly went on to receive this recognition. I mean, he was already looked on quite favorably because of his involvement in providing food to refugees after World War I, so now with this flood, he had a chance to once again save the day, this time in the public eye. This is what led to the huge media campaign that basically showed how devoted Herbert was to helping everybody affected by the flood. You know, the guy wanted to be president, so he wanted to look good, and the Red Cross needed him to look good because they are relying on public donations. And this is what led to everyone covering up what was really going on in these relief efforts. As it turns out, at most of these camps set up for people who were affected by the floods, black people were being held and forced to do hard labor and work on the levees. Only black refugees were being held and kept from escaping while being forced to do this work, threatened with weapons should they refuse, denied enough food, not being given shelter. To understate it, it was an atrocious violation of human rights. And while people were trying to speak up, the great humanitarian campaign was just too loud. This entire ordeal would later come out, unfortunately not early enough, however, as Herbert would go on to win the presidency one year later. There is a really incredible paper that goes into more detail about this insanely unjust cover-up that is titled The Red Cross is Not Alright, and it was written by Miles McMurchie for Dartmouth College in 2016. And if you want to learn more, it's really well written and it gives an incredibly comprehensive view over what happened and how it affected the race relations at the time. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Zichang rocket disaster. On February 15th, 1996, an attempt to get a satellite into space went horribly wrong. The communication satellite was made by American company Space Systems slash Laurel, and the rocket to get it there was the largest launch vehicle ever made in China. This rocket, however, failed shortly after the launch took place, which ended in it crashing into a nearby village. After the accident, a state news agency only reported that the launch had failed, but there was absolutely no mention of the subsequent crash and explosion. No one was really informed about this at all until two weeks later. That is when a more thorough report was 
was revealed, and it not only identified the cause for the failure, but also explained that there were only six people who had passed away, and there were 57 injured, but 49 of them had already gone home from the hospital and were recovering totally fine. Here's where things get tricky. There are many people who believe that this number of only officially six deaths was way lower than the number in actuality. Western media has speculated that a few dozen to somewhere around 500 people might have actually been killed in the accident, not only because of the village that the rocket crashed into, but also because of the reports that hundreds of people had gathered outside of the center's main gate near the crash site the night before launch. Some authorities and reporters also described seeing dozens of ambulances and many flatbed trucks loaded with what could have been human remains being taken to local hospitals. This has all led to stories of this alleged cover-up. Will we ever know for sure what happened? Only time will tell. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Kishtim disaster. The nuclear disaster that you might not have heard of, this disaster was hidden from the public for decades. In 1957, there were some citizens of the Soviet Union who had the option of living in secured nuclear towns. These citizens were picked and needed to qualify, but the perks seemed great. The citizens of them would have better wages, better health care and education, just a better quality of living. But there was the obvious potential danger of living over a nuclear site, like Chelyabinsk 40, which was built on top of a dump for plutonium waste. This of course proved to be a horrible problem when the storage facility exploded. The subsequent cloud full of radioactive material was so large it went on to contaminate the 9,000 square miles around the facility. Despite this clearly huge and lethal explosion, no one was notified of it right away. The people in the surrounding area of course knew that something had happened, especially when the military personnel showed up and they were suddenly being told to kill their farm animals and their crops, but no one was entirely sure what because no one was informing them of why. This blast affected at least 10,000 people who were all left in the dark for quite some time. In the end, it wasn't until 1979 that the disaster became public knowledge. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Fleet Street phone hacking. This is a scandal that started to unravel back in November of 2005 when Clive Goodman, who is the royal editor at the tabloid News of the World, wrote a story about Prince William and the knee injury he suffered. The thing is though, this knee injury hadn't been publicly revealed, which helped the royal family to quickly realize that someone had hacked into the prince's phone, likely his voicemail, which gave them this private story. Scotland Yard of course got involved, which led to them arresting not only Clive, but also Glenn Mulcair, who was a private investigator for the tabloid. In 2007, they both received jail sentences after they told authorities that they had gathered backdoor codes used by networks and used them to hack into and listen to people's voicemails. This isn't where the story ends, however, because in 2009, The Guardian, who was of course a rival of News of the World, revealed that the parent company of the tabloid, News Group International, had paid out over £1 million to settle lawsuits that might reveal the real depth of these phone hacks and other data breaches that they used to their advantage. Then another revelation came in 2011 when The Guardian reported that the police uncovered that the phones of over 5,800 people had been hacked by the private investigator. As a result of all of this coming to light, media mogul Rupert Murdoch ended up shutting down News of the World in 2011, and in 2012 he admitted that there was a cover up to hide all of this, and he publicly apologized for all that went on. In our number 2 spot today we have Rathergate. Apparently there's a lot of gate scandals, and this is just one of them. Also referred to as the Killian Documents controversy, this whole thing started on 60 Minutes 2. They were presented by CBS anchor Dan Rather, and the documents were extremely critical of former President George W. Bush's service in the Texas Air National Guard, and the reason it was such a big hit is because the documents were presented less than two months before the 2004 election, which of course could negatively impact his run. Later, however, it was revealed that CBS hadn't done enough to authenticate the documents, and that they were actually forged in order to try and push this controversial story of military service. Instead of just coming right out to say it though, apparently CBS stuck to the story and doubled down and claimed the documents were real and that the story was true. Eventually, especially as other news outlets followed up, the story couldn't go on any longer and CBS was not only forced to cop up to the mistake, but also most of the staff that worked on the show ended up getting fired as well. In our number one spot today, we have the Bankyo Dam disaster. Back in 1975, when Typhoon Nina struck, the Bankyo Dam was one of several that couldn't stand the storm. As the typhoon hit, there were 65 dams within three days that collapsed. It was truly catastrophic, and this left everything headed over to the Bankyo Dam, and despite everything going on, they thought the 
dam would hold, but of course it didn't. Here's the thing though, not everyone thought it would hold. In fact, hydrologist Chen Zing tried to warn the government that the dam was not being built properly and that it was about to fail. When he tried to ring the alarm, however, he was fired for being problematic. When the dam failed, just like Chen said it would, liters and liters of water washed through the nearest village, absolutely devastating millions of people. Over a week later, 1.1 million people were still trapped. After the disaster, the government remained mostly quiet to the public and didn't allow any media to make reports. And it actually wasn't until 2005 that the official documents were released because until then they were considered classified state secrets. It is thought that 85,000 people passed soon after the dam broke and through famine and disease afterwards, a total of 230,000 lives were lost. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Salem UFO. On the morning of July 16th, 1952, this photo was captured by Shell Alpert and has stumped people ever since. The photo shows four unidentified objects hovering in the air above Salem, Massachusetts and was taken at the Salem Coast Guard Air Station. The objects seem to be above the Winter Island and Cat Cove areas, but there really isn't much more that is known about this strange incident. There are a few theories regarding this photo. One is a camera glitch. Others think it may just be light reflecting off of the window that the photo was taken through. But of course, there are people who point to similar incidents that happened in the 1950s and of course believe it is proof of extraterrestrial beings. It is very likely we may never know exactly what's going on here, but the air of mystery it leaves is definitely kind of cool. In our number nine spot today, we have the frozen man of Mount Everest. This photo comes from 1996 and it shows Beck Weathers getting treated after the Mount Everest disaster. The Mount Everest disaster took place on May 10th and 11th in 1996, where there was a blizzard on the mountain that ended up stranding and taking the lives of eight people who were aiming to descend the mountain. Beck was a part of the team who was climbing the mountain on this fateful day and he ended up suffering from snow blindness during the climb. He actually fell into a hypothermic coma because it was so cold and he suffered severe frostbite on his face, hands and feet. Pretty miraculously, he not only survived, but ended up walking back down to camp in order to get help where he was then taken by helicopter to receive treatment. He ended up needing his hands, parts of his feet and even his nose amputated, but he survived this whole ordeal and that is the most important thing. In our number eight spot today, we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or most chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at a reflection in a pond. Okay, maybe a little little eerie, but not exactly chilling. What makes this photo what it is, however, is that there are seemingly two reflections looking back up at this little girl. No one knows who this girl is, where she is, or even when this photo was taken, but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. This photo was analyzed and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see the reflection of? Like a reverse vampire or something. In our number seven spot today, we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing, but it is called an elephant's foot. No, it's of course not a real elephant's foot, and instead is just called that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown, and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor, which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it it does still produce a deadly amount even today. Like so much so that just a few minutes of being around it is enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. For a long time, the severity of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster was being kept a secret from the public and those who it mattered to the most. Photos like these only give us a glimpse into this horrible disaster and how things went down. In our number six spot today, we have the penitentiary. This photo comes from what is left of the Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. This prison used to be the most famous and the most expensive in the world, but now this is the sort of thing that is left of it. This prison is actually now used as a tourist attraction and it becomes a haunted house during Halloween. The prison used to house some pretty high profile prisoners, such as Scarface himself, Al Capone. The prison was opened in 1829 and was known for its advanced technology for the time. They had things like central heating, flush toilets, and shower baths in each cell. These were all considered luxuries in 1829. 
The first prisoner to be held there was Charles Williams, who was facing a two year sentence for theft. When he arrived at the prison, he had a hood over his head so as to protect his identity, but also so that he wouldn't know what the rest of the prison looked like so he would never be able to plan an escape. While prison is never good, the craziest thing about this specific one is that all of the prisoners lived in isolation. I can't even imagine what that would be like, especially for the people who found themselves there for a long period of time. This photo is just a truly haunting reminder of all that once went on in this prison. In our number 5 spot today we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. This photo comes from 1971 during the Stanford Prison Experiment. For those of you who aren't familiar with this experiment, it started on August 14th, 1971 and was led by university psychology professor Philip Zimbardo. The experiment took student volunteers and divided them into two groups, one group of prisoners and one group of guards, and they placed all of the volunteers into a fake prison that was created for this experiment. Experiment. The experiment aimed to see if and how quickly humans would turn evil under the right conditions with the right amount of power. Basically it was a test to try and answer the question of if humans are inherently good or inherently evil. I think everyone was pretty shocked with the results. After just 6 days the experiment needed to be concluded because the guards began absolutely tormenting the prisoners. It really showed the kinds of things humans can be capable of even after a short time. This photo is definitely reminiscent of that experiment and it serves as our reminder. In our number 4 spot today we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from the inside of a house of one of the most terrible people, the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a full drum of acid that was located inside of his home. I probably don't need to tell you what it was used for because who has a full drum of acid inside of their home? especially when you're a serial killer. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully Jeffrey was caught and in 1992 he was sentenced to life in prison but just two years later he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number 3 spot today we have the gadget. This photo shows the first ever atomic bomb and it comes to us from 1945. Called the gadget, this bomb was an implosion plutonium device that was detonated in the Trinity test in 1945. This photo shows someone sitting next to it, so casually like it's a stuffed animal and not like it's a world changing device. The Trinity test was the very first time a nuclear weapon was detonated and the gadget was actually of the same design as the bomb that was later detonated over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th, 1945. There is a very eerie nature about this photo and the seemingly casual behavior of the man next to it. Did he know what this was about to unleash? Perhaps not, but more eerily. Maybe he did. In our number 2 spot today we have change. This photo was taken by Fred Blackwell on May 28th, 1963 and is actually showing us a moment of protest. The three sitting at the counter are Joan Trompour, Anne Moody and their sociology teacher John Salter. The reason why this photo is so important is because these three are sitting at a quote white only counter at Woolworth's 5 and Dime store in Jackson, Mississippi while being attacked by an angry mob. People are throwing condiments at them and I'm sure saying some pretty nasty things. Things. The two students went to Tougaloo College, which was a black college that ended up being at the core of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. It's amazing to see how brave they are and a photo like this is really such an important message for us to remember today. In our number 1 spot today we have Bikini Island. Bikini in the Marshall Islands was once inhabited by around 170 islanders until 1945 rolled around. The US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military continue to test nuclear weapons just in case they were needed in the future since this was shortly after the end of World War II. Unfortunately, Bikini was the place that was chosen to be the testing site since all planes and ships traveled on routes that weren't close to the area. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. Test weapons were detonated on the reef itself, on the sea, in the air, and underwater, and this photo shows what was happening during just 
one of these tests, and it wasn't even the largest one. Although the former residents of Bikini were promised that they would one day be able to return home, the island still remains uninhabited because of the mass amounts of radiation that still exist here. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Forgery. So for this one, we are talking about a scandal that happened that was entirely built on a lie, but this scandal is one that affected national politics at the time. So a man named Alfred Dreyfus was a Jewish officer in the French army in the late 19th century, but he was accused of treason as it was said he was selling military secrets to Germany. His trial was huge in the media and he ended up being sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island and hateful and prejudiced groups used him as an example of a quote unpatriotic Jewish person. After this sentence however, people began to suspect that the letters that incriminated him were actually forged and that the real culprit was a major named Charles Esterhazy. It is said that the French authorities tried to suppress these accusations, but a novelist named Emily Zola continued to accuse the army of a cover up. People were torn at this point. Some people swore that Alfred was still to blame, while others were convinced he was innocent. In the end, the fight became more about the principle rather than whether or not Alfred was really innocent or not. There were 12 years of controversy surrounding this case until Major Hubert Joseph Henry ended up admitting to forging the key documents before taking his own life. The case was finally reopened and while Alfred was found guilty again, he soon received a pardon from the president. A few years after this, a civilian court of appeals found Alfred innocent as well, and he went on to have quite an army career and he even fought with honor in the First World War. This was a scandal that really did change French politics forever. In our number 9 spot today we have The Project. It is said that throughout the last few presidential administrations that the American people were lied to about the progress of the Afghan war, the longest conflict in American history. According to the Washington Post, over 400 different officials, generals, aid workers, diplomats, and Afghan government personnel that were involved in the war deliberately lied to the American people about what was happening in the war and that they hid evidence that the war had become unwinnable. It is said that the documents that revealed this information were generated by a federal project that aimed to examine all of the causes for the failure of this conflict. The project provided 2,000 pages of notes from interviews with all of those involved. In our number 8 spot today we have federal spending. So, according to a Harvard Business Review article that was written by Peter Vanderwicken titled Why the News is Not the Truth, he claimed that the media and the government are, quote, entwined in a vicious circle of mutual manipulation, myth making, and self interest. He uses the effort in the 1980s to eliminate the federal deficit as an example, specifically focusing on the Graham Rudman Hollings Amendment. If unfamiliar, this was basically the first binding spending constraints placed on the federal budget. Peter states that for many years there were several media outlets that ran hundreds of stories on the debates over this budget and quote the views of all sorts of experts on the urgent need for deficit reduction and the eventual enactment of the legislation. He continues on to say that quote anyone who read a newspaper or watched television news received the message that Congress and the Reagan administration were heroically and painfully struggling to contain government spending and reduce the deficit. This is of course a list of government lies, so where does that come in? Well, apparently behind the guise of this diligent work, congressional committees and federal officials were actually increasing spending and adding new programs into the annual spending. Basically, the entire article describes how, quote, journalists conspired with politicians to create an image of a government fighting to end the deficit crisis, but they ignored the routine procedures that increased the deficit. In our number 7 spot today, we have listening in. Back in 2013, when Edward Snowden released a bunch of classified information and documents, it was leaked that the United States was spying on Germany, France, and Spain. It is said that the government tapped 35 phones, and not just anyone's phone, the phones of world leaders. Of course, when some of them found that out after the leak, they were quick to point out how spying between friends is just not cool. It was however also released that world leaders were not the only ones being spied on as it was found that the NSA was monitoring phone calls in Spain and these calls were between just anyone. And it wasn't just some here or there, it was said that about 60 million calls were monitored in just one month. That's so many! 
So yeah, everyone was definitely a little annoyed to say the least when this information was leaked. In our number 6 spot today we have the Verizon scandal. Again, back in 2013, The Guardian reported that the Obama administration had allowed the NSA to collect different caller information from Verizon. This is again something that was said to have leaked as part of the information that was released by Edward Snowden, and the information was able to be collected through what was called a quote, business records provision of the Patriot Act that was established under the presidency of George W. Bush. It allowed the government to order Verizon to hand over caller information every day. This information included things like the time, location, and the duration of the call. The information began being collected under the Bush administration in 2001, and they were collected from AT&T, Verizon, and Bell South. Of course, once these documents were leaked and this information became public knowledge, US officials began trying to reassure the public that this surveillance was some how necessary and was actually a program vital to national security, but many people rightfully felt like the spying was an unnecessary invasion of their privacy. This one is tricky because there's definitely a fine line when it comes to things like this. In our number 5 spot today we have the embassy missions. This is a secret that was hidden from not only the American people, but also the people that were being spied on and listened to, but it wasn't revealed until 2007 when a document was leaked. This document is one that named 38 different embassies and missions that were so called quote targets of US surveillance. The document didn't quite make it clear whether or not these targets were being looked into by only the NSA, or if the CIA and FBI were also involved. The document described certain things like bugging fax machines with devices that allowed them to listen in on conversations, and the document also listed the names of different programs that are used within the embassies. The document showed that the embassies targeted weren't just those of countries who seemed to be enemies with the United States, and instead included places like India and Mexico, Greece and Turkey, it appears as if the goal was to gain insider information into the diplomatic relations between the targets in the United States. The EU embassy in Washington DC was one of the targets on this document, and this leak had the potential to have jeopardized one of the largest attempted free trade agreements in the world, because shortly after this all came out, negotiations were set to begin between the EU and the United States. The French president at the time made his anger about the situation very public and stated that all future negotiations will only be made under the agreement that the United States cease all unauthorized surveillance of any EU buildings or personnel. In our number 4 spot today we have the Pentagon Papers. Former President Lyndon B. Johnson is said to have kept many secrets and lies about the Vietnam War hidden away until a military analyst leaked the records and exposed the truth back in 1971, right in the New York Times. The Pentagon Papers were a very secret Department of Defense study and the papers, when leaked, told everyone about the extent of America's political and military involvement in the Vietnam War. President Johnson certainly was not the only president named in these papers, as other names included Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy, who is said to have been extremely misleading about the United States' direct involvement in the war. The release of these papers really only fueled people in their protests against the war, and it was also one of the moments where the public lost a lot of trust that they once had in the government. In our number 3 spot today we have Watergate. This is perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel Complex in Washington DC. As the year went on and the 1972 presidential election came closer, there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington. Washington Post reporters that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported to the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There was a series of Senate hearings, and the Senate even went on to create a special investigation committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, and they had 
witnesses testifying that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in, and that there was a voice-activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks, and in the end, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators, which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on, but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent impeachment, Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign, making him the only president to do so. His successor, Gerald Ford, ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution, but there were 69 other people indicted, with 48 of them later being convicted. This is probably the biggest political scandal in US history, and it revealed corruption beyond what Americans at the time could believe, especially after the Pentagon Papers. It truly changed the way people would look at government leaders forever. In our number two spot today, we have The Call. So this is a lie, or maybe deception is a better way to put it, but either way, it came to light when the telephone calls of former President Lyndon B. Johnson were revealed. Basically, a phone call somehow came to light that showed that the then presidential candidate, Richard Nixon, might have negotiated behind the president's back with South Vietnam. Allegedly, South Vietnam ended up pulling out of the Paris peace talks after being told that Nixon would get them a better deal once elected. People believe that he did this because he was concerned that an earlier ending to the war would end up derailing his election campaign, since the war was one of the most pressing campaign issues. In the end, Nixon did end up winning the election by less than 1% of the popular vote. For many years, this was speculated and rumors were swirling, but once the phone calls were released, it seemed to confirm what many believed for years. In our number one spot today, we have the big lie. Okay, we've talked a lot about the United States government today, but of course, that's not the only government that has lied to its people. And some of these definitely aren't the most harmful lies told by the government, but this is one that would certainly make that list. Prior to the 1930s, and really the start of World War II, prejudice against Jewish people was not a new thing. Although the people who we'll call Yahtzees in order to navigate these online guidelines began to perpetrate these age-old lies. With the rise in this hateful group came a national policy that was called, quote, the final solution, which is a policy that we all know now was meant to eliminate Jewish people. To accomplish this terrible task, the leader of this group, who we'll call Madolf Mittler, and his minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, launched a huge campaign that was meant to spread lies to the German people that would make them believe that Jewish people were their enemies. Some of the lies spread were even ones that dated all of some of the lies spread were even ones that dated all the way back to the Middle Ages, and some of them had more modern context but were equally as outrageous, such as the lie spread that suggested Jewish people were to blame for Germany losing World War I. By using Jewish people as scapegoats, they were able to create what is now referred to as the big lie. Starting off this countdown, we have Leah Haley. In 1990, a woman named Leah Haley was randomly abducted by aliens. She remembers being on a spacecraft in a round room surrounded by bright lights. When she woke up, she found herself lying on her back on an examination table. Weird alien type figures surrounded her. Later, she decided to undergo hypnosis to try and remember more information about her abduction. And that's when she realized that the military might have had something to do with this. She also started to remember fellow abductees, who she later would meet in real life. When Leah started to say that the military was involved in her abduction, she was actually abducted by members of the US military and interrogated. They apparently told her not to tell anyone or else they would kill her. Then over the years, she was offered jobs randomly by total strangers for positions at nearby military bases. Cases. So she believes that she was chosen by the military for a reason. Although the military threatened her in 1992, she published a book titled Lost Was the Key, and it's all about her alien abduction experience. Coming in at number nine, we have Myrna Hansen. In 1980, a mother named Myrna Hansen and her six year old son, Sean, were headed home from Oklahoma when they approached a pasture. That's when all of a sudden they saw a beam shoot down from the sky and drag cows up into the air. When the UFO realized that Hansen and her son witnessed this, they abducted them. Through hypnosis, she was able to remember being taken to a deep underground military base. In fact, she was able to describe its location in great detail, to the point where members of the Air 
Force office started following her and her son around. Clearly, they were scared that she was onto them. Moving on to number eight, we have the member of the military. So in 1982, a man whose name was concealed for protection purposes was stationed on a military base in New Brunswick. Let's just call him Steven. So one night, Steven's friend and girlfriend left the base to go watch Tron in theaters. An hour later, they were back already. Their car had been smashed. Apparently, they were driving along a stretch of the highway to the movies when they saw a bunch of strange lights coming over a hill. A bunch of cars pulled over to check out the lights, including this dude and his girlfriend. That's when they saw a large disc with flashing lights fly up into the sky. Everyone ran back to get into their car and to drive away. As they were driving away, the craft crashed into the side of some cars, including these guys. A few days later, men in black showed up at the base looking for Steven and his friend. They told them that they better keep their mouth shut and to never tell anyone if they wanted to keep their military careers. Moving on to number seven, we have Robert Richardson. In 1967 in Ohio, Robert Richardson collided with a UFO while driving. However, after impact, the object disappeared without a trace. The only thing they left behind was a small lump of metal from their craft. A week later, he was visited by two men in black suits who told him to cough up the piece of metal he collected from the scene of the crash, which was hella sketchy because number one, how did they know about the accident? And number two, how did they know that he picked up this piece of metal? Richardson said that he gave the metal to the authorities for testing. The men told him if he was lying, they would kill his wife. Thankfully, he never heard from these men again. In our sixth spot, we have the abductee named Linda. One day, a woman named Linda Napolitano woke up floating mid-air above her bed. She looked around and saw some strange figures by her bed watching her. The next thing she remembers is being on board a craft where these figures were experimenting on her. Some of them looked like aliens, others were humans. Eventually, Linda decided to come forward about her experience and share it with the public. But upon doing so, two men kidnapped and interrogated her multiple times. This led her to believe that her abductions were either planned by the government, which makes sense as to why she saw both alien figures and human figures, or the military knows that aliens are real and are trying to learn more about them through the abductees. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Melinda Leslie. Melinda Leslie from Orange County, California leads a support group for alien abductees. More than three Three dozen of her attendees say that they have been taken aboard an alien spacecraft and then later have been reabducted by apparent military personnel and then subjected to physical examinations and interrogations. She herself has been a victim of this. She remembers humans in a flying triangle abducting her and taking her to an underground testing facility. There, a number of men in hazmat suits ran extensive tests on her. Eventually, she was abducted a second time, this time by a red-haired military captain who told her to tell him everything she knew about aliens. Coming in at number four, we have the Roswell UFO. Roswell, New Mexico is famous for their UFO sightings. This is the hot spot for aliens, apparently. Or maybe it's because the military has a secret underground alien base there. Well, in 1947, a rancher named W.W. Mac Brazel said he found wreckage on his big plot of land. In fact, during that time, there were a number of UFO sightings, so the rancher thought that the wreckage was from a UFO crash. So he brought that material to the sheriff, who brought it to an officer from the U.S. Army Air Force. Later, the U.S. Army announced that what the rancher found was a flying disc. But the following day, the U.S. military quickly backtracked, and they were like, oh, uh, no, it's not a UFO, it's actually just, you know, debris from a weather balloon. Then, years later in 1994, they admitted that the weather balloon story was completely bogus. Now, this isn't exactly an alien abduction story, but it's a real story of the military caught lying and covering up their tracks. Moving on to number three, we have the cornfield. This next story comes from a man who grew up on a cornfield. Their name was never released due to privacy reasons, but for our sake, let's just call him Bob. So one night, Bob saw something fly down from the sky and hover right above their farm. It was shaped like a rectangle and it was glowing light. Then it left as fast as it came. 
The next day, Bob and his family were greeted by two men in black suits with dark sunglasses. They said they needed to inspect the farm because there was a supposed natural gas leak. It was very strange because mostly everything on the farm was run by solar energy. Alas, the men were from the government, so Bob was like, okay, your authority, you know best, knock your socks off. The men then went out to the area where the UFO had been the night prior. Now, Bob did tell the men what he had seen. The two men said that if he ever repeated that, he was going to be arrested for endangering people. Like, what is going on and why is the military so sus? In our second spot, we have the test subject. Ever since Caitlin was younger, she remembers being abducted by aliens. At first, she thought she just had a wild imagination as a kid or was a vivid dreamer. That was until she was abducted again when she was an adult. She remembers being taken from her bed by weird men and then waking up on an examination table surrounded by bright lights. She could not move or scream. She knew she had been dreaming. The next thing she remembers is feeling something really hot on her face. The men around her were doing something to her face. Months later, she decided to share her story with the world. And immediately upon doing so, she was visited by two strange men who told her she better tell the press everything she was saying was made up or else she would pay the consequences. Fearing for her life, Caitlin refused to talk about her story to anyone ever again and declined any follow-up interviews. And in our number one spot today, we have Kendall Folk. Kendall is another woman who has been abducted a number of times throughout her life. At first, she thought these abductions were by real aliens. Later, she was able to debunk her own abductions and realize the truth. Kendall believes that she was targeted by the military due to her mental health issues. This makes her an easy target in their eyes because sadly, people will find it harder to validate her claims. She remembers during one abduction, she was taken from her home in a UFO craft. Later, she was able to remember that it was a car that pulled into her driveway, not a UFO. She remembers standing in her driveway and seeing this alien get out of the car and come towards her. Now she remembers how weird this alien was. It walked very robotic. And she believes that that's because it was in fact a robot. The military used this so that Kendall would think it was a real alien abduction. They later her and brought her back to a facility where tests were done on her. This is absolutely wild. Is it true? Is the military faking alien abductions just to run tests on us? This is mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs>